and welcome to season seven. So for listeners who are brand new to the show, understand uh, I started this podcast in August of 2018, and it has been a constant companion of mine over the years. And uh, starting in season two, it became an opportunity for me to connect with school librarians all around the world and across the country. And I am so grateful to every single one of you who have offered your encouragement and offered your talent and your time and you're generous with your resources. So friends, thank you so much and welcome to season seven, episode 284 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian beginning my 18th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Amanda Jones's upcoming book, That Librarian, will be available starting on August 27th, but you can pre-order your copy now. And if you use the indie bookseller Cavalier House Books in Amanda's hometown of Denham Springs, Louisiana, you will get a signed copy. I've included a link in the show notes. When you look at the cover of Amanda's book, you might recognize the Freedom Fighter shirt she's wearing. She reached out to the designer, Christy, who then designed a line of That Librarian apparel, as well as That Librarian flair, such as a bag, sticker, and mug. I love that we can all be That Librarian, who advocates for our students and their access to our books in our libraries every day. You will find a link to this online store in our show notes. Please note that 15% of the proceeds go to the Texas Library Association, as that is the home state of the designer. There's a good chance some listeners tuning in are familiar with Demco School Library Planner, and I'm guessing some of you have already ordered and received yours in the mail. This passion project is very much the product of Christina Holzweiss's vision and conviction that school librarians deserve a planner designed with us in mind. This is the second year I was honored to be invited to contribute as one of the 53 school librarians to provide helpful tips, strategies, and resources for this planner. And fun fact, Long-time listeners will recognize 22 of these school librarians as past guests on the program. I just happened to share a page with Lucas Maxwell, who has been on the show five times already. I am so grateful to Christina, who spearheads this project each year, and I've included a link in the show notes. Take a look. This spiral-bound comprehensive planner includes customizable tabs, months at a glance, ample space for daily notes, and goal setting, as well as resources such as daily celebrations, literature awards, and forms for completing needs assessments, curriculum mapping, grant writing, book fair planning, book requests, organizing your vendors' budgeting, weeding and self-reflection prompts, professional reflections, and much, much more. Consider treating yourself to this valuable tool in making the most of this upcoming school year. I've included a link in the show notes. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On Threads, you can find me at School Librarians United and on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 7. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. Friends, a little bit about today's conversation six years ago, if I remember correctly. I was asked by my state organization to serve on the conference planning committee. I learned something very important about myself from that singular experience. 
Not only was I bad at committee work, I had no interest in getting better. I saw no future for me in leadership at the state level, let alone at the national level. That being said, in the years to follow, I have had opportunities to interview school library leaders, to meet them at conferences, and to showcase them on the show, and I have the utmost respect for those among us who seek out and take on leadership roles at the state and national level. I am so grateful to Courtney for her friendship across the years and for entertaining my lines of inquiry, because while I will never aspire to run for AASL president, I know quite a few current library leaders who have considered a run and for whom it would not surprise me will become AASL president sometime in the not too distant future. And it is with them in mind and to the many curious others who tune in each and every week that we now provide a behind the scenes look at what it is like to be the AASL president. And now for today's episode, AASL President and my conversation with immediate past president, Courtney Pentland. Courtney Pentland, welcome back to the podcast. Hello. Friends, I I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to share this conversation. Courtney and I, you and I have crisscrossed paths over the last few years, <laughs> our friendship officially started in April 2019 on Twitter because we can document it. Uh, <laughs> and then you recorded two episodes, both of which were very important. Uh, the first one, it still gets many downloads. And that is because it was during the pandemic, you had an opportunity to interview for jobs and you were doing so in a very different way because it was the pandemic, peak pandemic, June 2020. You said, I've been interviewing for jobs and I've had to do this all virtually. And I said, that would be an amazing conversation. So friends, as you well know, interviews now are completely done. At least that first round are usually done remotely. So, you know, Courtney, (laughs) thank you so much for stepping up. Your first episode was done during the pandemic proof that podcasts are pandemic proof. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I really appreciated it. It, and while you weren't an expert, you had more experience doing this than anybody else I know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I interviewed for, I think it was three different positions in a district. And my husband was also interviewing remotely at the time for some other positions. And so it was, we we learned a lot in a short amount of time. Well, and most importantly, you allowed us to share what you learned from those experiences to help the rest of us. Episode two was a Can I Just Vent episode. And those are fun. We did a we did two of those episodes. Can I Just Vent two years later? And I think you actually mentioned in your vent, your rant, that you were throwing your hat in the ring for AASL president. That sounds accurate time wise. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate that you have been so willing to be a part of this podcast community, both a listener and a contributor. In the summer of 2021, my family was driving from Detroit to Denver, and we overnighted in Omaha. You and I got to meet in person and actually get a drink together. That was so fun. And we went shopping in our old market downtown and just kind of hung out. And it was the first time we'd ever met, like in real life. It was great. I'm going to say this is especially true of the library online community, like the online library community. When you connect and have those meaningful, supportive relationships, our PLN, I would feel comfortable reaching out to anybody in my PLN and saying, hey, I'm in town. (laughs) Would you like to get a drink? (laughs) And I shouldn't be surprised when somebody says absolutely, because that's what our, our PLN, some people call it their PLF, their their professional learning family, you know. But honestly, librarians are incredibly generous of their time and of their energy and their bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time I had ever said, you know what, I'm just going to say, hey, let's get a drink. And you're like, absolutely, I'll see you in five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm on my way. Yes, I'm on my way. And and it was like, it was, I literally, I was like, I, I knew I was coming to your backyard, but I didn't want to let you know because our timing was such driving from Detroit. I had very 
little in the way of control over the timing of it all. And it really worked out well. We have pictures to prove it. Today, we aren't going to focus really at all on your day job. But for listeners who have not heard your earlier appearances on the podcast, who haven't met you, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your library and the grades you serve, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, sounds great. Um, so my name is Courtney Pentland, and I am a high school librarian in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I serve about 2,000 students in an urban environment. We have students from all over the world. Uh, Lincoln is a refugee center, so we have actually the the largest population of Ukrainian students in our building right now in our district. So we have a uh, very, very diverse building, which I absolutely love. And that is a joy to be able to go and work with those students every single day. And then in my spare time, I also <laughs> teach as adjunct instructor for our University of Nebraska Omaha School Library program and have worked with our Nebraska School Librarians Association for over a decade at this point and am very involved with our advocacy work at this time. As um, many of you are aware, there are some troubling legislations that are going through states um, as well as some other funding issues and, and staffing issues and things like that. So working through that as well. So I am wearing my iLibrary all the time t-shirt uh, from the first episode I recorded with you, uh, where I just kind of flippantly said I library all the time. And it's very true. Um, even when I am not actively librarianing, I am thinking about libraries. Uh, so, you know, it is it is my air that I breathe. Oh, I love that. Friends, for the past year, and this would be from last July until this July, you have been AASL's president, and you've just wrapped up your role as president, and you're moving into the next role, which is immediate past president. I'll be honest, I don't fully appreciate when your term ends and begins can you give listeners an idea of what that looks like? As an ASL president, you are elected for your term year, which mine was 2023-2024, but you actually serve a three-year term. So I was the president-elect, then president, and now I am the immediate past president. And those go from July 1st until the end of June. So you have that full year. You know, it's no coincidence that many state organizations have mirrored this three-year progression. So I, I think it makes a great deal of sense to have those sort of parallel uh, calendars for our leadership. I'm clueless about the calendar for AASL leadership elections. Could you give us an overview of what the timeline looks like for those who are interested in running for national leadership positions? Okay. So there are positions that are available each year, and those rotate besides the president. So there are people on the board. For example, we have a secretary treasurer. We have a counselor um, that is connected to ALA. We have a person who is connected to our chapters group. We have directors at large who are elected. So there's those kinds of folks who it kind of rotates as their two-year terms are over. So each year, there are board members who are elected by the membership, and those positions rotate depending on two-year terms. So those include our secretary treasurer. We have uh, a liaison to our chapters group. We have a liaison to the ALA council. We have directors at large and then the president position. And so the president position is the one that is elected every year. And then the other ones kind of rotate in and out depending on timing. So that is established by a leadership development committee that is chaired by the immediate past president. So that will be a role that I take on this year. And that will be this fall. So we will put together ideas on candidates within the committee, uh, looking at a variety of different skill sets and 
and experience and things like that. And then the committee will put together a slate of candidates to go to the board and the board will approve the slate or not. And then that process continues. And at that point, we contact the folks who are potentially going to run for those positions because there's two people generally who run for the different positions and see if they are amenable to running for those positions. Sometimes folks will will reach out and say, I would like to run for a certain position, but not always. I don't know that that happens very often. And so I think people who are interested in those types of positions would be of benefit to, to contact board members and let them know that they're interested because otherwise we don't know and we don't know to put them on the list. So those um, folks are, are contacted. We go through some information with them and they consent to run or not. And then if they don't, we go back to our list and find another candidate so that we end up with two people who are running for those positions. And generally that is decided before the end of the calendar year. And then those folks start the process of campaigning, but we don't really campaign in a traditional way. We provide information through Knowledge Quest. We provide blogs through the Knowledge Quest blog. I think I recorded a video for mine that's put out through ASL, but we don't like promote ourselves. Other people can promote us, but we don't like campaign in the way that the ALA presidents campaign. That is an interesting piece. Courtney, could you just make that distinction? Because it's entirely possible that folks aren't aware of just sort of briefly, I, I was aware that during this, uh, you know, when ALA uh, had its uh, most recent election, I remember the candidates showing up on things like our clubhouse call or uh, joining us on a, on a, you know, sort of a, a space where we could all communicate, you know, like like a webinar. So that's an important distinction between what ALA presidential candidates do versus AASL presidential candidates do. Okay, so having never run for ALA president, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure what their process is, but I do know that they campaign. So they do go out and they meet with groups and they talk to different groups. We had both of the candidates come and talk to the ASL board, for example, and I know that they've met with other people. They have campaign talking points and all of those things. We don't. Well, and I remember hearing uh, that the ALA presidential candidates were actually sort of making the tour around different state conferences. So they were going to the state conferences as they were happening and making an appearance, whether formally or informally, but they were in part showing up to state conferences uh, that the different state school library associations were having. And, and if not in person, they were doing them virtually because I remember we had a, a we had a visit by both uh, candidates uh, at our clubhouse, and that that is not something that that we do in ASL. We don't do active campaigning, but we do put information out there for people to be able to view and to read, and from there, people get the information. And of course, friends and colleagues can share on our behalf. And so that would start in the spring or that would be the spring leading up to the election and the election i mean it's pretty quick i mean i think we were voting weren't i'm trying to remember when the the ballot window was open april i should know this okay. but i want to say it was in april <laughs> um i i voted yeah i should know that um, <laughs> yeah I, I you know yes i i know when it was open i don't know when it was closed <laughs> Right, exactly. So, um, yes, so all of that starts getting put together. Um, that information comes through and it gets posted out by ASL. And then the elections happen in the 
late-ish spring and people are elected and notified by May because they have to come to ALA as part of the new board. Got it. All right. No, I think, you know, it's sort of a hurry up and wait sort of process, I'm sure. (laughs) Hurry up and wait. Correct. All right. I'd very much like to learn about this past year as AASL president. I think we all need a better appreciation for the role, your many responsibilities, and maybe a behind the scenes for listeners who might consider throwing their hat into the ring and run for AASL president someday. Okay. So (laughs) it's um, interesting. Buckle up. (laughs) I know, right? Yes. So there's, there's, the three different years, right? You have different responsibilities each year. So the first year as president-elect, one of the things that is on your role of responsibilities is to select people to serve on AASL committees. So that get involved form that's on AASL that people fill out and they say, this is what I would be interested in. And these are my skill sets and my experience. We look through this very complicated spreadsheet and try to match people with areas of need and their areas of strength. And that is a huge part of what you do that year, uh, including going to board meetings and that kind of thing. And then each year we take on visits to state associations. So I was able to go visit Indiana during my president. Uh, elect year and see them. And then during your presidential year, this is where you, your responsibilities highly increase. You are the voice of the association. So anything that comes through for an interview, that's on you. If there's A request for something to be written from a partner organization, that usually comes to you first. Requests to meet with different like webinars or those kinds of things that that goes through the president. And that is very uh, deliberate that there's this one person who the board trusts to be the voice of the association so that we don't have to get approval on everything that we say and do. We we are able to do those things. So there's a lot of meetings (laughs) that happen. One of the things that I tell people or that I told people during my presidential year was that I do the same job that you do. I'm a school librarian. I work with students all day long. I just go to a heck of a lot more meetings (laughs) than you all do. So sometimes it was, you know, four or five in a week. Sometimes it was one in a week. It just kind of depended on what was going on. So You know, you have meetings to establish what's happening within the association. So I meet with the executive director every week to talk through those things. We would set up our town halls and what the focus was going to be. We would set up webinars and who the guests were going to be. And then I would meet with the guests to figure out what we were going to do. All those interviews that would come in, you know, you'd get that and say, hey, such and such wants to have an interview between now and tomorrow. Like they have a deadline Usually it wasn't that quick. It was like, hey, we we need it by the end of next week or something like that. So that was probably the most challenging piece because I, from the very beginning, set some very firm boundaries. I said, I am not available during the school day and let's, it's an emergency. And there's no other time that we can do this. Otherwise, I can do interviews before school, after school, or in the evening. And I think that's really important. I did the same thing when I was in leadership positions in our state association because I I think it's important for the press to know that we're busy teaching during the day, that we can't drop things and and just do an interview at their convenience. We have classes. We we can't just be like, sorry. I, I got to go do this thing. So it's it's a good way to honor my my full-time job, but also to show folks that what we do is not just sitting around reading all day and we can just take a break <laughs> to do an interview whenever we want. That's one of the pieces. So interviews, and then I did travel more. So you have a few more travel responsibilities and working with ALA. 
in some capacities. So there was a huge convening of states in December about advocacy training, and we were very, very fortunate to be part of the planning with the Public Policy and Advocacy Office and the Chapters Office in ALA. Um, We met many times to go over what that was going to be like and um, how to include school libraries and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, you write an article every month for Knowledge Quest, and then you write blog posts sometimes twice a month. So there were times that I would be writing two or three articles each month. So there's, you know, there there all of those things come into play. So it is a lot of time management and telling your family, I'm so sorry, I have a meeting. But I think it's vitally important for anyone tuning in to appreciate not just the demand on your time, but, and, and this is calling upon not only your skills as a public speaker, but also the demand on your ability to effectively communicate in writing. Listeners who tune in on a regular basis know I am not shy in broadcasting to the hills that I cannot write. I've always been very forthcoming with anybody who said, Amy, when are you going to write a book? I'm like, no can do. That is never going to happen. I was once asked to write an article, and uh, I'm not going to lie, it took me a month. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but writing for me is, is a task and not something I welcome. <laughs> but it sounds like you are called upon to write often in, 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 that, in how you are representing the role that you have here in, in our leadership at the national level. For some people like me, that's a deal breaker. And, uh, you know, can I just ask you why this year? Why this year in particular? Because you are very young and you have quite a bit of your career still ahead of you. You're not done. You're not looking uh, and counting down the the years till you retire. Uh, But what was it about this particular year that really spoke to you and said, you know, this is really something that is within your reach and you should go for it? First of all, thank you, Amy, for telling me that I am very young. <laughs> I am 45, just so anybody, you know, is wondering. I am I am definitely not at the end of my career, but I'm also not at the beginning. Um, the gray hair will, will show you. Um, but it was, honestly, I was asked. And it was funny because my principal, I was talking to him about roles and and things that I have been doing at the state level and the national level. I was the delegate for our state to ASL chapters, and I was sitting on a committee and those kinds of things. And um, he he asked, he said, you know, would would you ever consider running for president? And I said, oh, no. I mean, there's there's no way that that's going to happen anytime soon. He had had a teacher who had been the president of the National Social Studies Association, I think. So it was not an unusual question for him to ask. And maybe three to four weeks later, I was asked if I would be interested in running for ASL president. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I had no idea that that was even a possibility for me at that time. And I really had to sit and think about it. I asked my husband, first of all, he is very protective of me and my time and um, is very honest with me about, you know, are you really sure that you can take this other thing on? And I I asked him first, I said, this is a phone call I just had. Um, Kathy Carroll called me and I said, "I, I don't know what do you think? And he was like, well, first of all, holy cats, you know, like that is not his term. That's mine. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he, he was like, well, what, what all does it involve? Right. He wanted to know time, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and I got some of those details and shared them and he was, he was on board and I said, okay. And I talked with two of my mentors, um, that I trust and value and and have worked with in leadership capacities before and said, okay, I've been asked this. What what are your thoughts? 
do you think this is something that I I could do? Um, and they both were very supportive. And I was like, okay, well, running for AASL president does not mean you were elected as AASL president, right? So I was like, well, you know, let's let's give it a whirl. Let's see what happens. And um, you don't even know who you're running against until the information comes out, right? Like you, when you agree, you don't know who the other candidate is. And I understand why, because, you know, you you might accept or not based off of who the other person is. But I didn't know until everybody else knew who it was going to be. That is also very interesting. So you're in this very weird state between October-ish and May of not knowing if your life is going to change dramatically for three years. <laughs> you have you you know like you're just you're waiting like you said you're kind of in this in this waiting period hurry up and wait where you're just like okay well i i've done all the things it's up to the the members to vote at this point and whatever happens happens and we'll we'll figure it out it it really was a a surprise and i was so so honored to even be considered in the list of people that they were talking about and honestly, Amy, I don't know how many people said no before they got to be on the list. So, I mean, they could have asked 10 other people. <laughs> the person who said yes, um, you don't know those things either. So, you know, it's, yeah, so there, that's interesting. You've been president of your own state library association, Nebraska. Uh, in what way is running for AASL president different than when you ran at the state level in Nebraska? Okay, so in the Nebraska School Librarians Association and in many state associations, you are required to be a board member or a committee member or something. You have to have served in the association before you can run for president. Typically... In our state association, which is not super big compared to some other places, you run unopposed and you typically become like, hey, it's your turn <laughs> to do this. Um, and I did say no for a few years when when my kiddo was really small. And uh, finally, it was like, OK, fine, it's my turn. <laughs> so um, it was one of those things that you don't realize when you run for the, the board positions that eventually it could be you, <laughs> like it, it probably will be you, um, who will be president at some point. So that was not really, I, I didn't have to um, figure out if I was going to win. I was, I was the candidate. So I knew it was going to happen. So that, that was a little bit different, but the responsibilities, again, it's a three-year term. So you have some of the same things, um, Obviously not at the same scale, uh, but yeah, so it's really, really helpful to have been involved in your state association prior to serving at the national level because you understand how associations work. You know how board meetings are structured. You know how nonprofits work. Um, you understand the roles and responsibilities of an association, a member benefit association specifically. Um, so you you have that idea. So being involved at your state association at some level is really, really helpful. The other thing is being involved at ASL. So that's what gets your name recognized, first of all. And second of all, it gives you that insight. Had I not been a delegate to the state chapters group, to delegate assembly, I I would not have understood enough to be able to do what I've done the last couple of years. You are there in service of the entire country and more. So we have international librarians that are members as well. But it's not about your state at that point, right? We're, we're very focused on how our states run. All of our education systems are different. Our departments of education are different. Our funding is different. There's so much that that is unique to each state. 
in the way that our legislators work and all of that stuff. So you have to set aside your loyalty, I guess, not necessarily your loyalty, but your your focus on the place you're from and really think about how the decisions that you're making will affect people from coast to coast. And that is a huge responsibility, but what a beautiful responsibility to have. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Friends, I, I got to tell you, I was lucky to intercept Courtney in Oregon because you were there on an official capacity. It was one of your one of your trips. Yes. And uh, you were there as president of our national organization. I was there speaking. It was wonderful to be able to see you do your job as your friend, but also just as somebody who's like, wow, you know, this is what you do as president of this national organization. So, all right, I get to be here for that. And I, I think it's wonderful. So I know listeners are dying to know, but you are and you were a full-time librarian during your term as president, president-elect, and now as immediate past president. What conversations did you need to have with your school district when all of this was taking <laughs> place? So before I accepted anything, like I said, I talked with my husband and I talked with my my valued mentors and then... I had to talk with my district because it is something that requires time. It does require travel and it might require me to, when I had a free period, to do an interview if it was necessary at that time. So those were all things that I needed to get approval on before I ever said yes. And I talked with my director of libraries first because she is also a valued mentor and friend. And I had not been in the district super long. I had come from another district and had been there for a long time, so didn't quite know how everything worked there. And uh, the first thing I asked was, do I have to fill out a form if I'm volunteering for something? Because, you know, districts love forms. And she was like, no, you don't have to do that. And I said, okay. Um, do you think it would be possible for me to be able to do this and to do the travel. Uh, I know some people in the presidential positions have had to take their own days. They have not been given professional leave to be able to go and do their visits. Um, and that was something I was really concerned about. My dad was not in the best health. He was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as a whole host of other health issues. And so I wanted to be able to protect my leave time because we never knew what was going to happen with him. And thank goodness, my director is incredibly supportive and the school district is incredibly supportive. And they figured out a way for district library staff to come and cover me as my subs for the days that I was gone for travel for ASL which is huge. It ended up being more travel than anticipated um, at the beginning because we threw in our advocacy um, summit in December, as well as I went to Washington, D.C. to do some um, meeting with senators and representatives about library funding. Like there, there were some extra trips that were put in there that we didn't realize. And so that that was a huge gift, still is a huge gift that they've been able to do that for me. And I spoke with my principal, who was my principal at the time, um, and said, well, this is this is what's going to happen and this is how it could affect things. And these are the people who'd be covering for me and, and how that is. And I, and I just want to make sure you're OK with this. And he said, absolutely. I guess the previous teacher had to take a leave of absence and go away. And he was just happy I was going to be able to stay in the building for as much as I could. So um, that was those were the hardest pieces was just trying to figure out the, the time away from the building. But I will say the other thing that was really lovely is that my school board honored me with a commendation. Like I got a, I got to go speak at the school board. They gave me a certificate. My family was able to be there. And that was my 
president, like when I was elected. I have that certificate still. And that is what you would hope a school district and leaders would respond in that way and be very supportive of the role that you're taking on because they know that it's supporting all librarians. But again, I know that's not always the case for folks. So the the big questions to ask are, how is that going to work for the days that you need to be gone? And how is that going to work if you, you know, need to take a plan period to do an interview? Is, is that going to be okay that you're doing an interview on school time? There's some districts have very strict rules about that kind of stuff. Thankfully, I have an incredible district that I work with that allowed me to be able to do the work that I did the past year. Which leads me to my next question, because when I saw you in Oregon, I got the impression that this was not the only state organization you were going to be visiting during your tenure as president of AASL. Am I right? There's some sort of like rotation that that you you have. There is. Yep. So you can actually look it up. It's online. If you look up President Travel AASL and it'll pull up the rotation. It's a six year rotation where you get someone from either the president elect president or immediate past president. And I ended up more places, like I said, than intended (laughs) because I had some that were specifically for me. But we had Kentucky was added on in the summer because there was a scheduling issue with COVID or something. I can't remember what it was, but I ended up going to see them in the summer. And then I was scheduled to go to Minnesota. And then I saw you in Oregon. And then I was in Tampa for the national conference. And then I went to Chicago for the advocacy convening. Then I was in D.C. to meet with senators and representatives. And then I went to Montana, which was an added one for me because they became our newest state chapter. They had not been a full chapter at that point, and they were able to do the things that they needed to do to become a full chapter. So they got their visit this year, and it just didn't coincide. I think Becky was supposed to go to Montana, and it schedules didn't work out. So I did that trip, and then I was scheduled to go to Rhode Island, which I did. I'm trying to think of all the places that I've been. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Well, and friends, I've included a link in our show notes. So oh, perfect. you <laughs> went to Rhode Island, Minnesota, Tennessee, Oregon, and West Virginia. Tennessee. That's the one I forgot. So after Tampa, I think, okay, so Kentucky was the summer. Then I went from Minnesota to Oregon to Tampa to Tennessee within six weeks. That was a lot. That was a lot of being gone. So thank goodness I have staff in my library and I had people covering for me. So it was that was good. And then I had a little bit of break until December. And then, yep. And then Montana, Rhode Island. And then I am going to Alaska with you. By the time this comes out, we will have been there. Um, So it will be really fun. But it's, um, again, Kathy Lester was supposed to go, but the timing didn't work out. So I get to go to Alaska. You know I mean? Yes. I, so- and I, I will tell you in, in advance, we had an amazing time in Alaska. <laughs> I, you know what? I can just it was the best. guarantee that that's the case. So yes, we're, we're, we've got a, yeah. a crystal ball here and we're going to be able to tell you right now, friends, Alaska was amazing. <laughs> I will say the state visits though, are probably one of the things that is the most important that we do because we get to meet with members and non-members like school librarians and really hear their stories. We get to see the presentations that they do. We get to have conversations. Uh, we we get to present. That's great. We get to share our, our own information. But for me, the most valuable part is just having conversations with people and talking about their celebrations and their struggles and being able to take that information back to the board. We fill out a report after every visit 
And then we talk about that at the board meetings and, and we're able to say, OK, well, this is an issue that's coming up in Oregon. But, hey, I also saw it in Minnesota or, you know, that kind of thing. So it it really gives us a, a different perspective than even what the delegate assembly does because you're face to face with people and you can have those longer conversations and you can meet with state leadership of their school library associations. So it's hugely valuable. It's it's great that, you know, we get to go visit all these cool places. But I think in Tennessee, I really saw the conference center. <laughs> that was maybe it, except um, one of the lovely board members on the way to the airport, we stopped at the Nashville Public Library and got to go um, look up at the children's room. But, you know, like we're, we're there to work. We're not there to um, be tourists unless we have the time to do so. But most of the time it's we're we are meeting and talking with people as much as we possibly can. I love the intentionality of a schedule because it means that no one is going to be left out when it comes to having an opportunity to connect with our national leadership and to be able to speak directly to the people who have the most impact on affecting change on a national level that would also then trickle down to the states, regardless of whether there are many librarians in our state or relatively few. I'm aware, Courtney, that you had several important initiatives that you were able to make a priority during your tenure as president. The focus of my presidential year was on building relationships. That is something that I think is so incredibly important. It is a huge part of what we do. We have no purpose without the people we serve. The best way we can do that is by building relationships with those people to be able to know how best we can do that. And one of the things in relation to that, that I was noticing the trend of uh, people speaking about school libraries who had no idea about school libraries. There was a lot of false narrative that was happening. And one of the ways to combat that was to get accurate narratives out there. And we can speak until we're blue in the face about what we do. And people will say, oh, well, of course you would say that. That's your job, right? Um, how, how can we trust you to <laughs> say the, the right thing about our jobs, right? Uh, but if we have other people who are able to share accurately what is happening in our school libraries, that's all the better, right? So how do we do that? We do that by building relationships with people. We do that by talking with parents and fellow teachers and administrators and school board members and state legislators and um, your PTA, PTO, you know, those, those types of groups. How do we build relationships with those folks? And that was really what I was looking at doing was having that and having it be a positive focus. There's been so much that has weighed us down over the last few years that it makes it feel like our job is not great, <laughs> you know? Like there's there's a lot that we're facing that, that feels like so many hurdles. But the thing that I keep coming back to and that I speak about so much is that we have a joyful profession. We have a really great job. We... I think the best job in education. And one of the ways to help remind ourselves of that is to build those positive relationships with other people because we get to talk about the cool things we do and the fun stuff that happens and you know um not not always to focus on the positive like that's the other part is like you got to be real about it too. The struggles are there but the celebrations are too. So how do we get the that word out there? So that was really important to me. So every article I wrote, every town hall I did, every webinar I did, the speeches that I had at state conferences, the things that I, I spoke about and, and talked about at the national conference, all of that, all of my work focused on that core tenet of school librarianship. We do not have a presidential budget. So that is not, I mean, we're very fiscally minded in how we spend our budget and there's not a lot of wiggle room. So we were so incredibly lucky that Emily Drabinsky, the ALA president, um, at, who was president when I was president, gifted us with um, some money to be able to 
focus on a youth initiative. And I decided the best way to do that was to get as many people involved as possible. So we did a town hall with John Shu, who is a pure delight. If you do not know John Shu, follow him on all the places. He is he is an he is joy in a human, right? And he wrote a book called The Gift of Story. So we gifted 100 copies of The Gift of Story to people who could apply for the book. And then we had him He gifted us an hour of his time to talk about the book, and that is available for anybody to watch. So if you would like to go back and watch that town hall, you absolutely can. All the town halls are available for free for anyone. You do not have to be a member. All the webinars are available on ALA Connect. So if you missed any of those, you can go back and watch those. Knowledge Quest blogs are always available for free. And the Knowledge Quest um, articles that I've written this year are probably available in your database system somewhere. So all of that stuff should be at your fingertips if you are interested in reading or hearing or watching any of the things related to the presidential stuff I did this year. They're out there. So that really was so important to me to focus on that that idea of relationships. Because honestly, I would not be here today without it. Like I would not have been ASL president without the relationships that I had in my life. What advice would you give to anybody contemplating running for president of AASL? I would say the first thing is, and we talked about this just a little bit, is to get involved at your state level so that you have a really good understanding of how associations work and to to see if that work is something that matches with what feeds your soul, because not everybody is energized in that way. So, you know, that's a good testing ground to see if if this is right for you. The other thing I would say is fill out that get involved form from ASL so that you can volunteer for committees. Most of those committees are appointed in the spring and those go out. But here's the thing. We always have task forces that are created, new committees that are created. So we actually fill positions throughout the school year throughout the whole calendar year, actually. So if you haven't heard anything yet, that doesn't mean that your time isn't coming and there's no bad time to fill out that form. You can also fill out that form if you would like to write for the Knowledge Quest blog or the Knowledge Quest print edition. So if you would like to get started maybe in that way, that's another opportunity. I was a Knowledge Quest blogger for a year and that was really fun. So there, there's many opportunities to get to know that. You can also run for positions within ALA. You can fill out information to be on ALA committees. So there, there's ways to do that. So there, there's many different ways to get involved at the state and national level that can help prepare you for this leap. The next thing I would say, if you, you've done all those things and you are ready, then reach out to, to me or to anybody on the board. And you can let us know that you are interested in running for a potential leadership position. There are so many different ones that are available. You can reach me at aaslpentland at gmail.com. Or if you have questions and you want to know more about what what things would be like, I'd be happy to answer those questions. But yeah, so those would be my suggestions is to get involved. And then if you're already involved and you're like, yes, this is my thing, reach out. You do need to have a supportive network around you because that presidential year is intense. That is a thing that you need to have your district and school support and you need to have the support of your friends and loved ones. Well, I think that's fantastic advice because I I know people in my orbit who would be fantastic as president of AASL. And while I will never choose to go down this path, (laughs) I will happily support the person who does. Can I ask, is there anything that really surprised you about this leadership role that you took on? Because I'm sure there was a lot of predictability to it. And you're like, yeah, I, this makes sense. But there was anything that really sort of caught you unawares as you went through this year. So 
having been in our state association leadership and and working with that for so long, there's definite differences between state and national level leadership. One of the biggest things is we don't necessarily drive much of what's happening in the day-to-day work of the association. That is the committees. So the committees that are appointed by the president-elect, they do the, the work. The members do the work of the association. So, for example, there was a bylaws committee that went through and they were updating bylaws and they did a ton of work. We didn't see that. We weren't part of those committee meetings. We didn't you know what the, we saw the, the end results when they'd send things to us for for voting. But they did the heavy lifting of that. So that day to day work that is happening, that big, you know, the stuff that you see from school uh, library month or from uh, the awards committees or from those kinds of things, we we aren't directly involved in any of those things. That comes to us from members who are gifting their time and volunteering to do this. So there's even the national conference, right? So people there were like, oh, thank you so much. And I was like, I really had nothing to do with this. I showed up and I went where they told me to. There are conference committee members who do so much work for that. And I don't go to those meetings. Heavens to Betsy, if I had to go to all of the committee meetings on top of the other meetings, I would, I, I, I that's not possible, right? That's just not possible. So you you rely on your members to really do the work that they've agreed to do. And the other part is, even though you are helping put together the board schedule, there's things that you can add and things you can't, but you are not a voting member of the board. So when you are a president, you do not vote. So you are a tiebreaker if needed, but you do not cast a vote at that time. So as immediate past president, I now get to vote again. But as president, you you don't. You are the person who is um, leading those meetings. So that was interesting information. I did not realize that. So there's there's a lot of things that happen that the president is not directly involved in. Um, the board is not directly involved in, but we help determine the direction of the association. So one of the things that we've been working on very heavily this year is updating the strategic plan. So where where do we go next? And so we have those big higher level conversations, but the nitty gritty day to day stuff is is left to our staff members and our member leaders to take care of. So yeah. Courtney, what this sounds like is is there's there's a macro and there's a micro, and and you can really get into the weeds with with and and all of us on some level have experienced being micromanaged, as in a, a leader who comes through and uh, and and micromanages us. And I'm I'm sort of speaking from personal experience, but you know, but you it sounds like you and the new vantage point that you have is that you have now been able to survey this organization as it moves at multiple different levels. And, and, and now from, from being the president and now you're the immediate past president, you have a far better appreciation for the intricacies of how this whole organization works together to support a common cause, as well as the, the, the causes which each state might have to champion from time to time, depending on the politics and and the the cultural uh, influences which have uh, sort of moved so much of of what we where we are right now in this in this world. So, can I ask, what do you wish you'd known prior to taking on this role as president of AASL? Is there anything you would have been like, wow, I would have liked to have known that before I did this? <laughs> I will say one of the things that people probably don't know, 
that would be really helpful to know is that we are asked to go to ALA annual. That is something where we have board meetings. We have three board meetings in addition to all kinds of other meetings. There's a lot of meetings that happen during ALA for us. And so that is not something that is subsidized by AASL. We don't have the budget to be able to pay for that. The The trips that we take to the state associations, our travel and our per diems and, and that kind of thing are covered by AASL. And then the state covers our hotel. But when we travel to ALA, that is our responsibility. So that is one of the things to know ahead of time that if your work location is not willing or able to pay for your travel to ALA for four years because you have your president-elect here, like when you're coming in as president-elect, then you have your presidential year, your immediate past president. I feel like it's four years, but maybe it's just three. But you, you are footing the bill for that. So that is something to really contemplate if you have the the financial wherewithal to to make that happen and how how best to make that happen so that is one thing that i think people would like to know ahead of time before they uh took on such a responsibility i'd love to also include because i was able to meet your family in oregon i love that when you had these travel opportunities and obligations that you were able when you could incorporate a family component, and especially with ALA, because you were going to be footing the bill for this, it, I'm aware that you and your family were able to join you in Oregon as part of a larger family vacation, as well as when we were in San Diego. You're paying for that trip. You might as well. You had a whole nother family vacation after your time that you spent in San Diego. We did. So that I I was very, very lucky this year. I applied for a, a grant through our foundation in our school district and was granted a gift of some money to help with the expenses for ALA, as well as my school district paid for some of the expenses this year. It is four years because I'm like, I was in DC, then Chicago, then San Diego, and then I'll be wherever, wait, Pittsburgh? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, I think, is next summer. And then so that that really helped out significantly this year. Those other pieces, you know, that you got to figure that stuff out and and timing and arrangement of things. So we we have taken advantage of being able to uh, spend that time together. My kid is going to be a junior. And so we drove from Omaha to San Diego. We did the epic American road trip to be able to spend some time together and and have some memories together. So that has been that has been a huge gift for us to be because that's something we talked about doing for years, you know, kind of pie in the sky. Wouldn't it be great? And this like gave us purpose to make that happen. Courtney Pentland, you are a vital part of my virtual PLN and occasionally in-person PLN. Uh, fortunately for me, I've been able to, to connect with you across the years. How can listeners find you on social media? So I am, I will be honest, this past year, I have not been great about social media, mostly because my life has been a little chaotic for a variety of reasons. But I plan to be a little bit more active again coming up. Um, I am on many things right now. <laughs> uh, I refuse to call it X, but um, that's what it is. Twitter is where I'm mostly at, um, at live, L-I-V, love, L-U-V, library. And I am also on Instagram and threads and blue sky and some other places. And if anybody knows how I can post to all of those places at one time, instead of multiple links that I have to send out, please, dear goodness, let me know because that would make my life so much easier. But yeah, so I'm, I'm there if you'd like to connect. I will try to be better about checking all of those things and posting to those things than I have been in the last year. So um, you can, again, like I said, email me at aaslpentland at gmail.com if you have any questions or follow-ups or anything um, that you'd like to connect with. 
Courtney Pentland, I am going to be forever grateful for everything you've done to guide our organization during a rather precarious time in our current history. And I'm so grateful for our friendship. Thank you so much for everything. I know listeners will benefit tremendously from this conversation. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a fantastic school year. Thank you. And I just want to leave one last thing for listeners. Do not have imposter syndrome. You all can do this. If you are if you are interested, be brave. Say yes when people ask you to serve in leadership positions. Try things. You never know where things are going to take you. Somebody asked me if I would help with a conference that our State School Library Association was doing. And because somebody asked me that, I was your ASL president. So, you know, you just be brave. Say yes. Thank you so much, Courtney, and have a fantastic rest of your summer. You too. Friends, if you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. And perhaps the library leader in your life who might just be our very next AASL president. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. Now is a great time to order Demco's School Library Planner and use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more. See the link in today's show notes. The topic of our next episode will be Mr. Library and my conversation with Tim Jones. I hope you will tune in. Thank you.